Colorado will be back in the Big 12 next summer. I mean, this is what we're all talking about is what is happening, what's next. Had to bring somebody on to chat about it. Zach Seegers, uh, senior writer, editor for Mile High Sports, joining us today. Zach, welcome to the 1012, man. Thank you so much for having me. I, I'm excited to even have it make sense for me to be on the the 1012. I think <laughs> it's going to be an exciting chapter for all of us. I mean, that's the, I mean, obviously the, the other nine schools in the PAC 12 aside, like big 12 fans are, I mean, thrilled. This is, I mean, from a big 12 perspective, it's the first time in more than a decade, the conversation around the big 12 has been a, a positive one, that the word stability has been thrown about and used in reference to the big 12, that there's not someone who's just waiting for the inevitable demise of this conference. So like, it's a very, positive feeling for the big 12 fans so i'm I'm curious from a colorado perspective like what's the vibe with colorado fans right now yeah well i i remember when we left the big 12 i was thinking that the big 12 was gonna die you know you had us leave nebraska leave um mizzou left in that same stretch and then um a&m of course so i credit to the big 12 for persevering and, and managing that whole situation a lot better than the PAC 12 has, you know, as we arrive at this juncture. And I think, yeah, for Colorado fans, you have to be excited. I think this is another win that coach prime has helped the program secure uh, before even getting on the field. You know, I think everyone knows this year might be rough in the wins and losses column. Um, but what he's already brought to the university is insane. I think, it's underrated how bad last year's team was under Carl Durrell. Like that, that argument for the very worst team in all of FBS football. I think a good number of FCS teams could have whooped them too. Um, so it's turning around and I think, yeah, the big 12 is very exciting. I think it's always made more sense for Colorado to be in the big 12 rather than the PAC 10 slash 12 uh, just regionally. And of course that's where their roots are. I know the fan base is very excited about it. You have, really like CU doesn't have a lot of Pac-12 fans you know they have a, a good year or two but I don't think they've ever won a bowl game they've never won a yeah they've never won a bowl game as a member of the Pac-12 conference like they haven't instilled a really strong and they've never made the sweet 16 during that stretch either so they don't have like a really strong Pac-12 fan base all the fans are people that remember the glory days of the Big 12 and the matchups with Nebraska and Kansas and Kansas State and those rivalries, even Oklahoma State. Um, and I think there is a palpable excitement to get that nostalgia back of the CU glory days. And, you know, Prime's a part of that and going back to the Big 12's part of that. Uh, so I've got a couple other questions kind of tied to some of the things you mentioned. So I'll go kind of in order based off things you've said. Obviously, the comments have been made, you know, Deion Sanders would like to be in Texas. He has a very strong reputation in Texas. Texas is a place that he's very well known. It's a place that Colorado used to be able to recruit well, not so much since they moved to the Pac-12. I'm I'm trying to figure out how a percentage point, because the idea of giving someone who's never actually coached a game at your school uh, an amount of power to dictate where that university should be located as far as conference goes sounds crazy no matter who the head coach. i don't care if nick saban shows up at your school tomorrow if he goes we're going to this conference like i don't I, okay hold on so like if you were to put a percentage amount on this how much do you think dion actually influenced this decision i'm sorry i was muted i, I don't think he's <laughs> seen it on the cu side all that much i think cu was looking at this I think he might have influenced it more on the Big 12 side, just by making CU less of a dumpster fire. I think, you know, the Pac-12 looks like it's headed for collapse and we're going to have a bunch of schools heading all over the place. I'm sure CU would have been one of the stragglers to catch on with the Big 12, but I think it would have been a less appealing deal. They would be looking, they would be one of these teams looking for a life raft as opposed to, I think, with Dion and then some of the big recruiting moves they've made on the basketball front as well. Um, the program just looks better. It, it The whole athletic department, I should say, not just the football program, but the whole athletic department just looks nicer. The women's basketball team just made the Sweet 16 and gave Caitlin Clark a run for her money. Um, I think it just looks a lot more respectable. Like CU's been great at skiing and nothing else for a while. 
And right now, and, you know, the, the Big 12 uh, listeners probably aren't as familiar with it, but right now, CU is a, in an exciting place with all their teams. Um, obviously, the Coach Prime stuff, everyone will know that. But on basketball, they're bringing back just about everyone, and they're adding the number one recruit in the nation for some services, and another top 50 recruit. So like they can make some noise this year. Um, and they're bringing back, you know, again, their biggest stars from last year. The women's team is losing one person. It was their the worst member of their starting five. And they brought in two top 100 recruits and two, three uh, transfer portal people. So that and that team was in the Sweet 16 last year. They're going to make some waves. Um, so I don't think he and I know CU has been working on this for a while. They've been. I think looking outside of the Pac-12 since at least last off season, last summer, I should say. Um, so I don't think he he was a big decision making factor for CU, but I think he he polished that turd up a lot. I mean, it certainly doesn't help when you bring in somebody who's avid about being able to get into Texas. Uh, the other thing, and it's kind of a question I had had already, which was, what do you think is is stronger uh, between two things? One. Uh, the the sadness Colorado fans will feel about in losing certain Pac-12 rivalries or relationships or the excitement about renewing relationships with, I mean, teams in Kansas State, Iowa State, Kansas, and Oklahoma State that they have been with since the beginning of the Elite Eight for a very long time. Yeah, it's, I think there's a lot more excitement. Again, there's there's that feeling of wanting to return to nostalgia and that fan base never got built up in the Pac-12. Like you say, those Pac-12 rivalries, what rivalry? There's like maybe a little, there was a, a year of spice with Oregon when CU went up and upset Oregon uh, uh, in Autzen. Like, but I don't think that was ever a rivalry. Definitely not from Oregon's perspective. Um the Utah thing, they've tried to make it a rivalry, but man, like even being a CU alum and being on campus while uh, they were in the Pac-12 and having those rivalry games, I don't think anyone cared about that. People care about Nebraska. They care about CSU. Frankly, I think they care more about beating Kansas than beating Utah. And the only, the rivalries they're losing, the only ones where I think there's any heat are Arizona and Utah. When we talk about the schools from the Pac-12 that are most likely to follow Colorado to the Big 12, it's the Arizona schools in Utah. Um, so I don't even know if they're losing a rivalry necessarily. And even if they are, that those Arizona and Utah rivalries are far less serious than Kansas, Kansas State even, I'd say, and, and CU. Yeah, I mean, it, look, th- that relationship is already there. <clears throat> and so I, I think there, there are certain things we have to talk about when it comes to Colorado of this is a win for the Big 12. But it's not the same as bringing in Oklahoma or Texas. You're not replacing Oklahoma or Texas from a branding standpoint or a quality of, of, of opponent standpoint. You're, you're bringing in a program that was, that, I mean, hasn't just hasn't been very good on the field or on the court. You're bringing in a program that you had a relationship with. This isn't like pulling somebody random i mean it will be a to me a bit almost a bigger deal to bring in an arizona or any other pac-12 team that's been part of the pac-12 since it formed back in the 70s like so it's i'm not trying to like not be excited about colorado this is a big win for the big 12 because of the way people have talked about and viewed the big 12 since 2010 but they like it's not to downplay it but it's a win but it's not it's not enough, and I don't I don't think the like my opinion the Pac-12 is not going to like die. Is the Pac-12 as we know it in shambles? It's been that way ever since USC and UCLA left. But like that conference will find a way to survive by picking off pieces from other conferences in theory. Yeah, yeah, and I agree with that. I think that's what we're going to see. Um, I think Oregon and Washington are out. I think there's a pretty good chance. Arizona and Utah are out. Definitely Utah. The Arizona schools we'll see. They're they're probably a little tougher. Um, and then yeah, I don't know what they'll do. Maybe San Diego State, Boise State makes some geographical sense and is solid. I, I think maybe even some sort of combination with the Mountain West. Uh, or again, like you said, it might just be a poaching of Mountain West schools. Um, I just, then what happens to the Mountain West at that point? Maybe the Mountain West dissolves. It's going to be an interesting trickle down because I I agree. The Pac-12 is going to look for solutions. 
I think they might have been blindsided by this to some extent, which is the fact that you were blindsided at all by this is pretty embarrassing. Um, but uh, they're not completely blindsided by it. I think they at least knew it was a possibility and they've had some talks with some schools. I think San Diego State's move from a couple weeks ago, a month ago, I forget exactly how long ago that was when it feels like it's been a while, <laughs> right? When they when they had that moment where they're like, "We're leaving the Mountain West." Actually, never mind. We're staying. <laughs> I think that speaks to maybe the Pac-12 looking to make some moves. So, I think they'll survive. But I really think Oregon and Washington and Utah are out. And okay, like the CU's the smallest headline in that. But in the near future, that conference is without USC, is without UCLA, is without Utah is without Washington, is without Oregon. Man, it's hard to take the schools in that conference seriously all of a sudden. And it's it's going to be interesting to see what happens to the Pac-12 in the coming months. Um, as the Big 12 looks to add a 14th team, at least, um, they've been, that is the messaging right now is they're going to get one more. I think all the focus right now is on Arizona, so we'll kind of see how that develops. For Colorado, I mean, Rick George, I don't, I think he said the word stable or stability in his press conference enough times that if you took a shot for every one of them, you're still hung over. Um, stability is also obviously a big thing, knowing how much money they're going to get because Colorado will get pro rata. They're going to get the 31.7 million, like every other big 12 school under the new contract. The money is good. The stability is good. Access to Texas is good. I, I'm curious what else you see from a win for Colorado. Like what are some things in your mind that the move to the PAC 12 hurt or didn't work out in the way that they thought it would, that a return to the big 12 should help improve? Man, that's a good question. I think just maybe the management, I think it's so clear that Brett Yormark is doing an amazing job with the big 12. You talk about this kind of being a, a watershed or a landmark moment for the big 12 after how they've been talked about for a decade and a half, just about now they're being talked as this talked about as the stable conference. And I think that has to do with what Brett Yor Yormark has brought to the big 12 and what George Klofkoff and Larry Scott did with PAC 12. I don't think they did a good job. I think they, the media right stuff is terrible. You, you have a statement from Klofkoff, like, a week ago, right, at, at Pac-12 Media Days, where he's talking about not getting a media deal and saying it's a good thing because it improves the conference's leverage. Like, that's in, that's how? <laughs> how is that a good thing? That's insanity. Like, the writing on the wall. ESPN's not an idiot. They cover sports for a living, believe it or not. And they know that you guys are in trouble if you don't get your media rights packet. They have all the cards. They have all the leverage in this situation. Um and that's just a small example, but I think the incredible mismanagement of the Pac-12 um, paired with solid management from the Big 12. And also just, I think you guys have been better. Maybe it's been being lifted by Oklahoma and Texas and then Kansas and basketball. Um, but even like the teams like Baylor and TCU springing up, I feel like the Big 12 has been a lot more relevant than the Pac-12. Um and I don't know how much of a, a factor that was in, in the administration's decision, but I know it's a factor in the fan base's excitement. Uh, the Pac-12 is such an afterthought to all of media, to all of voters, to all of fans, to all of these recruits and the re families of those recruits who would like to see their kids' games. Um, the same can't be said for the Big 12, which is in three time zones. Or four. Is it four now? Uh, it will be... Well, is Colorado West enough? Colorado, Utah? I mean, in theory, in theory, it's four time zones because you could you could put some Colorado BYU after dark if you absolutely need to. Like I we'll see. Um, I mean, this gets close the Big 12 closer to that goal that Brett Yormark has. I mean, okay, so so let's ask this then. I mean, Deion Sanders was named the head coach of Colorado on December 3rd. We sit here recording this on July 28th. So we're at roughly what, 10 months, the last 10 months. I mean, is this the best 10 months as a Colorado bus fan in the last, like how long? I mean, maybe since the national, definitely in my lifespan, uh, born in the late nineties, I can't think of a more optimistic time. Um, I think the football team might be sneaky good next year. Like, 
I know it's crazy because you're looking at such a turnaround from an absolute garbage fire, but they've brought in a lot of talent. I think they're at least going to be able to put up points and it'll just be like, can the defense hold up well enough against the run that they aren't just trounced over? I think that's enough to, to hit that three and a half win mark. Um, But then just the future is so exciting. Like Colorado fans, have never gotten to celebrate on social media about like stealing a recruit from Alabama or Florida state or Georgia or Texas or Oklahoma. Like that is crazy. Like it just has never happened. It's like, Ooh, I hope we can beat out the CSU Rams for this two star. And now you're seeing five stars that were offered by every single blue blood school to see you. Um, Yes, of course it happened or what matters is what happens on the field. And we can talk about talent index, you know, kind of as part of that and all that stuff, but it's just exciting to be in the conversation, like be uh, college football's problem. I think is that it's fairly regional. You know, there's a few areas of the country that matter and the rest of the countries are uh, uh, stomping mats for everyone, walking mats for everyone else. Um, It's cool to see CU get some wins over those programs you never expect. And then while that's going on, I kind of already laid it out, but the basketball team and the women's basketball team have a brighter future than they've ever had. The the women's team since they had Seal Berry in the early 2000s and the men's basketball team in the modern NCAA tournament era. Uh, This team's never made the Sweet 16 before, and they have a very good chance to do that next year. In fact, I think it'd be a disappointment if they don't. Uh, I, I would advise Colorado to either add baseball or softball as you are returning back to the big 12, something that would be worth uh, adding in. Don't, I mean, I don't know what you're going to do with the skiing program. We don't have skiing in the big 12. Uh, we'll see what happens there. I, I imagine they can't lose the skiing, but we'll have to, <laughs> we'll have to make some uh, compromises. The baseball team might be doable. I know there's been some clamoring for baseball for a while on campus and the uh, they have a club team. Um, that I think won like the club tournament this year. So there, there, there's something there. Maybe we can join in <laughs> get trounced. Uh, so let's wrap on this, Zach. It's obviously this is going to be the last year in the pack 10, 12, nine uh, for Colorado. Uh, what's the, what's the, what's the thing you feel like now, as you look forward to this, what is now going to be the last season? Like, is there going to be something you're looking forward to something you're excited about some final thing that, might make Colorado fans, you know, feel a little sad, get a little, get a little misty about leaving, or is this just going to be one of those years where like, let's just get through this and get out of here. I think everyone's just so excited for the future. Cause I think rational CU fans know that this year should be a lot better with prime, but you're not winning anything of serious importance this year. Um, but in 2024, after he has like two years to maybe overall things, I don't know. I think some fans are optimistic enough to think that maybe CU can make some noise in 2024. And so I really think it is like, a let's see how exciting 2023 is and all these new pieces and enjoy that. But I don't think any of that has to do with the Pac-12. Everyone's excited to get on to 2024 and, and get on to the new thing. The only thing that might make CU fans misty eye would, would be losing to CSU or Nebraska. <laughs> that would that would cause some tears. Um, I think the the exciting thing to watch now is that TCU CU opening game. Now it has even a little more heat behind it, and CU fans are going to be hooting and hollering if they can pull off the upset there. I mean, it it will be it might even be better. We we might have some real palpable. And I think it's already there, but there might be billowing smoke of excitement coming from the Boulder area. I don't know. Everyone remembers that viral, crazy party that happened at CU Boulder a year or two ago. It it might be like that all over again if they can manage to upset. (laughs) Yeah, going to be a Big 12 preview now. CU versus TCU uh, in week two. So very excited for that one. Zach, appreciate your time, man. Uh, Just in a trying to take everything in that's going on is like trying to drink from a fire hose, but uh, uh, it's, it's still an enjoyable experience. So enjoy it, man. And uh, enjoy covering your, uh, your buffs this season. Absolutely. will do. Thank you, Tom, for having me.